Welcome to the NHK. Tatsuhiko Takimoto, read by David Cadaver. Chapter 9, Days of the End, Part 1. To a Hikikomori, winter is painful because everything feels cold, frozen over, and lonely. To a Hikikomori, spring is also painful because everyone is in a good mood and therefore enviable. Summer, of course, is especially painful. It was a summer loud with the sound of cicadas. From morning to night, they kept whining and whining. The summer was also cripplingly hot. Even if the air conditioner ran constantly, it remained hot. I didn't know if my air conditioner was wearing out or if this summer was just especially hot. Either way, I was thoroughly boiled. Sometimes I wanted to yell, Whoever is responsible, show yourself. I didn't have the energy to do it, though. The summer heat had worn me down completely. My appetite was depressed, and my nerves were exhausted. No matter how much Lipovitin D27 I swigged, my weariness was impossible to dispel. Only my next-door neighbor was energetic. He unabashedly made noise. From early morning until the middle of the night, anime songs rang out in loud volumes. He said that recently he needed only four hours of sleep a day. He was working hard on his creative projects with the help of anime songs. Bloodshot eyes flashing, he vigorously applied himself to these meaningless activities. One day, Yamazaki said, I've finally gotten through a big part of my game. Oh, really? Tomorrow, I'm going to start making a bomb. What? Without answering, Yamazaki silently gnawed on some white bread. It was a pretty half-assed breakfast. As I wasn't as lazy as he was, I properly toasted my bread and quickly fried an egg. Like I told you before, don't take food out of other people's fridges without permission. I pretended not to know what he was talking about. Misaki was wearing long sleeves, even though it was summer. She was in a good mood, though. This is so fun, so fun, so fun, she said. She really did seem to be having fun. She was swinging happily on the swing set. Of course, tonight felt tropical. It was so hot that I sweated even without so much as speaking. Misaki, however, seemed cool enough. Hair streaming behind her as she energetically swung back and forth, she said, by the way, Sato, do you want to eat the leftover cat food? At some point, the park's black cat had gone missing. It had been quite a while since he'd shown himself. Either he had been hit by a car and gone to heaven, or he'd taken off on a journey somewhere. At any rate, I turned her down. I don't need it. I stocked up on that cat food. Huh, what a waste. Jumping off the swing, Misaki stepped into the cozy sandbox next to the jungle gym. Picking up a green shovel that one of the neighborhood kids had left behind, she started making something in the sandbox. I asked, what is that? A mountain. She was right. It certainly was a mountain. Set in the middle of the sandbox, it was a sharply peaked mountain. It angled steeply like Mount Fuji drawn by Hakusai thus looking as though the slightest vibration would make it crumble. But the sand mountain soon was perfectly complete. It was wonderful work using sand, wet with the evening dew. C clapping her hands to brush off the sand, Misaki circled the mountain once. She looked expectantly at me. I said, It's a nice mountain. A little smile on her face, Misaki shouted, Yeah! and aimed a forward kick at the mountain. Things with shape will fall apart one day. That's right, I nodded. There was actually a huge variety to the books Misaki pulled out of her backpack night after night. She apparently borrowed them en masse once a week from the library. There were novels, poetry collections, practical guides, and reference books. Misaki read books of all different shapes and sizes, and then she would read them to me. Well then, the text for tonight is The Last Words of Famous People. 
Its title refers to the words that exemplary people leave behind at the moment of their deaths. Refers to? Let's think about what life is, she cried. It was a dramatic line, and I was done in by Misaki's ability to make such grand, unusual declarations with an utterly normal expression. Then again, seen from another perspective, well, compared to yesterday's topic of let's think of what it means to be alive, it wasn't that big a deal. Regaining my composure, I urged her to continue, and Misaki immediately started reading the text aloud. The book collected the last words of famous people from all around the world, from ancient times to modern days. I listened quietly and respectfully. As she read from the book, however, Misaki seemed to grow bored with it, and her theme changed along the way. More light. Well then, whose words could these be? What? A quiz? Three, two, one. Time's up. The answer's goes. Well, that line is too cool, isn't it? I think Mr. Goth might have thought it up far, far ahead of time. Maybe he did. Okay, then, next question. Mika Chororo was delicious. I knew this one. It's the marathon runner, Kokichi Suburaya's death note. Ping pong, ping pong. That's right, I'm amazed you knew that. I couldn't really brag about knowing famous people's last words, but Masaki praised me anyway. She sounded oddly taken with the contents of that death note. Mika Tororo. This is like some kind of joke, isn't it? Conversely, that might be why people are struck by it. I see. That really does clear things up for me, she said, nodding repeatedly. Subaraya... The runner apparently went home to the countryside right before he died. Then, he ate grated yam with his mother and father, it says. Hmm. I guess everyone wants to return to their hometown before they die, after all. Now that you mention it, Misaki, are you from this city? No, I'm not. The North Star is in that direction, so I'm probably from over there. Misaki pointed in a north-by-northwest direction. She said the name of the town, I didn't know, and explained that it was a small town on the Sea of Japan with a population of 5,000. According to her, it supposedly had a beautiful cape, but that cape had become a somewhat notorious spot for suicides. Ever since some famous person jumped off its cliff during the Meiji era, it's like it's become a mecca for suicides. They say so many people either jumped deliberately or slipped and fell accidentally that they had to construct safety barriers to prevent further incidents. When I was little, I didn't know anything about that and was always playing on those bluffs. One day, I saw a strange woman there, Misaki continued. She was by the cliff's edge, on the high cape. It was a beautiful early morning, and the sky was bright red. The woman, too, was beautiful, and I took my eyes off of her for just a moment, and she vanished. Even now, I sometimes see her in my dreams. It might have just been a dream to begin with, though. I mean, she had a really cheerful smile on her, and a healthy-looking face. Alone, she stared at the ocean and late afternoon sun, and then, in that one short instance, as I glanced away... She disappeared. A strange story, isn't it? It was a strange story. What could have happened? I think she should have at least left a suicide note, maybe about grated yam or something. I joked, trying to lighten the mood. I want to eat some grated yam. It makes you itchy. Yeah, she nodded. It's delicious, though, isn't it? The conversation had begun to stray. I, too, was exhausted, after all. But Masaki was laughing. Ah, how fun, how happy. You think so, too, don't you, Sato? Sure. We're coming to the end. The last day of the project is approaching. Masaki returned the book to her bag. 
I've given all these helpful lectures, Sato, so you should just about be ready to become a model adult, right? Standing up from the bench, she said, You understand now, don't you? Why you've become a worthless person? Why you've become a hikikomori? You should understand by this point. I didn't answer. If you think about it properly, you should definitely understand. Still seated on the bench, I looked up at her. The park was so dark that only her silhouette was illuminated. I couldn't see the expression on her face. I'm nearly out of time. I can't cause any more trouble for my aunt and uncle, so I'm going to leave town. Her tone was absolutely casual, so I listened to her calmly. Where are you going? A city. Some place where there's lots of people. Some place where no one knows me. Some place where I don't know anyone. That's why, by the time I go, Sato, Sato, you have to become an outstanding person. I couldn't tell where this discussion was going. And then again, she was a girl who said terribly unreasonable things. Dazed, I shook my head from side to side. That won't change anything, said Misaki. Okay, I understand. I'm fine now. All I could do at that point was try to convince her of her success. No, because of you, I really have been reborn. You should rest assured of that and start a life of your own in a new city. She still seemed somehow dissatisfied. In an optimistic tone, I said, Thank you! I owe you my life! Oh, that's true. Want to take my stereo with you? It's a necessity for living alone. If you want it, I'll give it to you as a present. That isn't what I mean. It isn't what you mean? I waited patiently for her to continue, but Masaki turned her back to me without saying anything else. I stood up too. Well then, goodbye. I started walking toward my apartment. As I did, Misaki called out, No! Wait a second! What? Let's go on a date. It'll be your graduation exam to test whether you really have become an outstanding, socially adept person, Sato. Meet me at the station Sunday at noon, and we're definitely going, even if it rains. With this defiant declaration, Misaki quickly strode away. Meanwhile, Yamazaki really was making a bomb. He had gotten a hold of a bomb recipe from the internet and was really, truly manufacturing a bomb. First, he needed to make black gunpowder. The history of black gunpowder went way back into the distant past. For example, it was used during the Gangkau period of Mongolian invasions and the weapon called Tetsuo, which surprised the samurai, also used black gunpowder. Despite being an extremely primitive compound of potassium nitrate, sulfur, and coal, its force is tremendous. They say that when used in an enclosed space, black gunpowder generates enough power to break all the windows on an average car and instantly kill the people inside. What are you going to use that bomb for? It's obvious, isn't it? I'm going to blow something up. Well, yeah, that was true. It was indeed obvious. There was no other use for a bomb. I meant, what are you going to blow up? That's what I wanted to ask you. My enemies. Who are your enemies? Villains! I'm going to get those villains with my revolutionary bomb. I see. Well, who are the villains? Like politicians or something. Do you even know the name of the current prime minister? Yamazaki grew silent and went back to his work. Before long, he had completed the black gunpowder and the airtight iron pipe. His detonator, which used an analog clock, also was finished. The only thing left was to attach the detonator to the pipe, and then he could set it off at any time. Yay! I'm done! I'm a fighter! I'm a revolutionary! Yamazaki was in high spirits. They'll all be blown up! I'll kill all the villains! He was in high spirits, but he was also entirely self-aware. Ah, that was fun, he concluded. In the end, though, the bomb didn't blow up any villains. To start with, we didn't know where to find any villains. 
Because there was nothing we could do about that, we tried to blow up the neighborhood park on Saturday night. So no one would see us. We crawled deep into the brush to set the detonator. The bomb actually did explode, but with more a whimper than a bang. It was a sad story. Amid these distractions, Sunday arrived. As I had promised, I met Misaki in front of the station. We had our date, and I returned to my apartment. I slept all night. When I awoke, it was morning. I had nothing to do and was bored. I decided to try ingesting my entire stash of stockpiled drugs. I started having a good time. Everything became pleasurable. I laughed. Part 2 In general, drugs can be classified into one of three large categories, uppers, downers, and psychedelics. Uppers are drugs that make you energetic. Cocaine and stimulants are famous uppers. Downers are drugs like heroin, which make you sluggish. I'd never tried them, so I didn't really know firsthand, but it seemed that taking them would feel really, really good. And psychedelics are hallucinogens. LSD and magic mushrooms represent that category. For the most part, I really preferred legal hallucinogens. They had a few side effects, unlike uppers and downers, and more than that, they were easy to get because they were legal. On the day after my date, I took drugs again. I decided to take a rather aggressive approach. First, I set the groundwork with 30 milligrams of AMT. AMT is an antidepressant that was studied by Russian scientists. After they discovered that a large dose could cause hallucinogenic effects, it was prohibited for medical use. Still, it was originally just an antidepressant. After taking it for the first two hours, a person would be plagued with terrible nausea. Once that was over, however, it became entirely pleasurable. It also happened to be the best thing ever for combating bad trips. Next, I boiled down the seeds of a harmal plant and drank the yellow layer of liquid that floated to the top. Harmal, a plant, I think, is in the goat head family, originated in Tibet and contains the indole-type psychedelic compounds harmine and harmaline. Using it by itself doesn't produce any real effect. In combination with other hallucinogens, like magic mushrooms or DMT though, the effects are amplified dozens of times over. That's the ayahuasca method. The harmal is an MAO inhibitor. It could be life-threatening if ingested with cheese or other dairy products. But as long as those foods are avoided, it shouldn't cause any problems. Well, my real opportunity had arrived. My consciousness already was dimming, and the edge of my vision wavered wildly. But here my true trip would begin. I would keep going and going. Grinding five grams of dried magic mushrooms with a mortar and pestle, I washed the powder down with a single gulp of orange juice. On top of that, I screwed up my courage and ingested a 10 milligram crystal of 5-MeO-DMT. DMT is a drug containing only the effective components of hallucinogenic plants like chakrapanga, which natives of the Amazon use in their ayahuasca ceremonies. Though legal, this drug is reputedly one of the strongest anyone can find. According to one theory, the hallucinogenic effects are more than 100 times more powerful than those of LSD. It's truly the ultimate psychedelic. In just one second, I had become paralyzed. The drugs had taken effect. The Sato Special, my wonderful ultimate method, devised through research and trial and error, was complete. By effectively combining four types of drugs into a single cocktail, I was promised the ultimate trip, one that even illegal drugs couldn't touch. With a hard thrust as if riding a rocket ship, I was shot into the far reaches of outer space. Time stopped entirely. Space began to warp thoroughly. My physical body disappeared. This is no good, Zato. I found out something terrible. I've had an epiphany, Yamazaki declared. This is really, really bad. I tried to say something, but my mouth wouldn't work. Yamazaki was getting agitated. Are you listening? Listen closely. This is a really bad thing. 
as there was nothing else I could do, I listened closely, pulling himself to his full height and wearing the largest grin imaginable. Yamazaki said, I was able to logically prove that I am the monotheistic god who created the cosmos. I died. And then I came back to life. Please watch, and I'll clean up your room now using my superpowers. Yamazaki pointed his finger at the rubbish scattered about the floor and screamed, Move! Naturally, the rubbish did not so much as twitch. Hey, I'm ordering you. Why are you resisting me? Yamazaki fumed. Observing this situation, I felt something rise up inside of me. It was a strange sensation. Bubbling up from the very depths of my body, folding my arms, I thought carefully about this feeling. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, I realized what it was. I know. This is... It was nausea. I was attacked by violent nausea. I tried to dash to the bathroom, but the path there was challenging. My legs wouldn't move forward. The hall seemed to have stretched into a 1,500-foot tunnel. The bathroom was so far away. Would I make it? Could I get to the bathroom before spraying vomit everywhere? I'll be fine. Calm down. Yamazaki had just said it. He had said, I am God. But I knew. I knew that his words were completely mistaken. How did I know? Because I was God. I had confirmed that truth just a moment earlier, using a thoroughly logical thought process. I would definitely make it in time. I am God. I will make it to the bathroom in time. I made it. Prostrating myself before the toilet, I threw up. Afterward, I felt much better. Then I became energetic. I was enjoying myself. Skipping slowly back into the room, I found Yamazaki squatting there, still grinning. It's no good. Elementary students are no good. Muttering under his breath, he looked like he was thinking of something criminal. For some reason, his situation triggered an extreme sense of deja vu. This sort of thing has happened before, hasn't it? While I thought about it, ten consecutive aggressive feelings of deja vu suddenly hit me. Everything I was looking at had happened before. I decided to engage Yamazaki in a discussion about this sensation. After a moment, I became unsure what was really going on. Huh? Have we had this discussion before? What are you saying, Sato? I have no idea what- Wait, wait, wait a second. Let me think carefully about it. Lying face down on the floor, I thought as hard as I could. When I did, I was able to remember. I was a soldier from an ancient civilization several thousands of years ago who had transmigrated through time and space to come to this world. Naturally, I decided to keep this revelation from Yamazaki. It was a gravely important secret, after all. After a little while passed, Yamazaki broke in on my thoughts. You should breathe. You're dying. I breathed. I came back to life. Sincerely thanking Yamazaki, I pondered the way that the world was wrapped in love. I bowed my head to say, thank you, thank you. However, as if to balance out my return to life, Yamazaki abruptly acted like he was in extreme physical distress. Clutching his throat, he rolled about on the floor, writhing in agony. When I asked, what's wrong? He just uttered an inhuman cry and without speaking, continued convulsing. Finally, he picked up a notebook and a ballpoint pen in order to communicate the problem to me. Hands shaking, he wrote something down in the notebook. Taking my time, I carefully deciphered his letters. I forgot how to use my voice? Yamazaki gripped his throat, looking miserable. I whacked his back as hard as I could. Ouch! He said. And then he gave me a thumbs up. His broad smile returned. I decided it was time for us to head out. It was already the middle of the night, so I wasn't afraid that we'd be seen by the police or any neighbors. We headed toward the neighborhood park. Yamazaki was walking like a robot. Maybe he really was a robot. 
in the end, could I have such thoughts and also be a human? I found the idea a little mysterious. At that point, I tried banging my head against a street lamp in the park. This was bad. It didn't hurt. It didn't hurt at all. I am actually a robot. Thus, I discovered a new truth. Be that as it may, the park at night was wonderful. Though the street lamps were the only light source, the park shone and glowed like a photograph taken using a long exposure. The park was full of life. Everything there pulsed with life. The gentle creaking of an old bench, the steady breathing of massive trees lining the road, the dynamic twists of the branches and leaves. All this, every last thing, was alive. While I was transfixed by the scene, Yamazaki said, I can hear music. I heard it too. From somewhere in the park, inexplicably beautiful music was playing. We were looking for the music source, pushing our way through the grass, shoving our heads under the bench, combing the park for quite a while when, at last, we found a speaker. It was buried in the roots of the largest tree by the road. However, it was strange. We didn't really understand the speaker's mechanism. Yamazaki and I considered it together. We concluded that the speaker was a white hole, which pushed out matter rather than sucking it in. We walked into the white hole and emerged near a beautiful lake. Yamazaki slowly shed his clothing and dove head first into the lake. However, Ugh, it's a sandbox. It seemed that the lake was in reality just a plain old sandbox. It really had looked like a lake to me. I decided that I couldn't trust what Yamazaki told me. In any event, it felt as if time had been playing tricks on us. First we were going back in time, and then we were headed forward into the future. I thought about this. When could now possibly be? Hey, Yamazaki, what day of the week is today? There was no answer. It seemed as though he had gone back home already. Having grown sad, I climbed into the brush, picking the spot where he had detonated Saturday night's bomb. In the brush were Yamazaki and myself, from three days ago. Okay, it will explode after three minutes. Please back far away from it. Me, myself, and Yamazaki retreated. I wanted to be a revolutionary, but that dream didn't come true. I wanted to be a soldier, but that dream didn't come true. My father is dying, and then I'll have no choice but to go home. I wonder whose fault that is. I think there's some evildoer out there. I wanted to blow him up, like in a Hollywood movie, with this bomb. You know? As I could see only our backs, there was no way for me to check Yamazaki's expression as he said all that. But I already knew. Huh. Three minutes have already passed, but it didn't explode. Yamazaki walked over in the direction of the bomb. As he did, I heard a loud bang, and Yamazaki fell over. I knew. I knew that he had been crying. This has no force at all. This bomb I worked so hard to make only has the power of a few firecrackers. This is no good. I'm going back home. See ya. And then he went back home to the countryside. When I returned to my apartment, only the life-sized anime doll that Yamazaki had left was waiting for me. She asked, Aren't you lonely? No, I'm not lonely. On that warm, sunny day, I had gone on a date with Misaki. It unfolded as wholesomely as a date between middle school kids in the countryside would have. We took the train into the city. There were large crowds, so we nearly lost sight of each other. Neither of us owned a cell phone, so if we were separated even once, it would be the end of everything. In this large city, we never would be able to find each other again. We had to be careful. Even so, Misaki was wandering heedlessly. I, too, was mostly just plodding along. Where should we go? I asked. Somewhere. What about lunch? 
We just ate together, didn't we? What about a movie? Okay. We watched a movie. It was an astounding Hollywood action flick. Someone was being blown away by bombs and he swung his arms around in circles as he floated high up in the sky. Then he died. I longed to be like him. That was very interesting. Do you think I should buy the informational pamphlet? Misaki was blown away by the thousand yen price tag, though, so she didn't end up buying it. Why are they so expensive? It's the price they usually are, isn't it? Hmm, really? It seemed that she hadn't known. When we exited the movie theater, we were once again at a loss of what to do. Where should we go? Somewhere. What about lunch? We just ate, didn't we? We kept walking aimlessly. We had no place to go. I didn't know what to do. Misaki felt the same way, and we were both troubled by it. Eventually, we arrived at a needlessly large city park. There were a lot of people there, of course, and in the very center was a large fountain. Pigeons fluttered around us. Seated on the bench, I was dazed. We chatted amiably until sunset. Finally, we ran out of conversation topics when only our restless silence remained. Misaki pulled her secret notebook from her bag. Let's walk toward our dreams. I responded, It doesn't matter anymore. This stuff isn't going to change anything. Don't say such negative things. Even if I try to believe these lies, in the end, there's nothing I'd be able to do. Actually, they've made me quite normal. What part of you? You don't think I seem normal? She asked. You're strange, I stated. You've always been strange, ever since I first saw you. I thought you seemed rather off. Really? We both grew silent. In front of us, a pigeon waddled by. Misaki tried to catch it. Naturally, the pigeon escaped. She repeated her attempt several times. After they all failed, she simply stared at the fountain in front of us. Then she said, Sato, when it comes to you and me, and the idea of which one of us is more worthless, you must be more worthless than I am, right? I agreed with her completely. Well, that's why... That's why you were selected for my project, Sato. It seemed she had finally decided she wanted to discuss the heart of the matter. At this point, though, it really didn't make any difference, as nothing was going to change. At least that was my conviction. Misaki was smiling a fake smile that would have made anyone seeing it nervous. It was an uncertain, manufactured smile that touched only her lips, unnaturally pulling them upward. She began... The initial premise is that there's no way anyone could end up liking someone like me. You really think that? It's been like that since I was born. It was so bad that my mother and father hated me, and it was even worse with other people. I didn't have any response. My uncle and aunt took me in, but I just created problems for them, too. Their relationship is getting worse, and they say they want to divorce soon. It's all my fault, and I'm really sorry about it. You're just thinking about it too much. No, I'm not, she said. I probably was born useless, and normal people won't have anything to do with me. Eventually, everyone starts hating me, and because of me, everyone starts feeling bad. I have actual evidence that what I'm saying is true. Misaki rolled up her sleeves. Holding out her arms, she made me look at them. Many many sad scars from old burns marred by her white skin. It was my second father. I don't even remember his face. He drank continuously. While he drank, his mood would improve, but even when he was in a good mood, he was always getting angry at me, burning me with cigarettes. She said all of this, her bright smile unwavering. I was even scared of school and couldn't go. Of course I was scared. There was no way I could fit in with everyone else. I was terrified. Because if they were normal people, they were absolutely sure to start hating someone like me. What about the people at your church? Those are good people. Everyone there is pretty normal. And they're working their hardest, so of course they won't have anything to do with me. I didn't say anything. 
Finally, I was able to find someone more worthless than I was. A really worthless person. A totally worthless person. The kind you can't just find anywhere. Someone who can't look at people in the eye when speaking, who is unbearably afraid of others. Someone who lives among the dregs of society. A person whom I could even look down on. Who was it? Sato. Her words were exactly what I expected. Then Misaki pulled a sheet of scrap paper from her bag and handed it to me. It was the second contract. I felt unsure what I should do. The sun was nearly beneath the horizon and the number of people walking around the park had shrunk considerably. Misaki handed me a marker and a vermilion ink pad, saying, A thumbprint will be fine. After all, someone like you, Sato, might start liking me, right? She asked. I mean... You're even more worthless than I am, after all. As I've been carrying out this plan for such a long time, and you should be my prisoner, right? Please be nice to me, and I'll be nice to you, too. No, this won't work. Why? It's no use. Nothing's changed. This agreement just makes everything more painful. On top of that, it's too empty. I got up and returned the marker and ink. I tried to be enthusiastic. You'll be fine, Misaki. This is just a momentary lapse of confidence. Have a rub down with a dry towel and train your mind and body. If you do that, these stupid thoughts will disappear. A cute girl like you will be able to have a great life. Don't look down. Look up, and you'll be okay. Then I ran away. The contents of the contract had seared themselves into my brain. Contract regarding mutual support for worthless and lonely people. Defining Sato Tatsuhiro as Party A and Misaki Nakahara as Party B, the two parties agree to the following. A will not start to hate B. In fact, A will start to like B. A will never change mind. A will never have change of heart. When one party is lonely, the other will always be at his or her side. As B is always lonely, basically, A will be at B's side. If we do this, I think our lives will probably move in a good direction. I think the painful times will go away. If you break this contract, the penalty is 10 million yen. Hey! Aren't you lonely? Misaki called out. Turning around, I answered in a loud voice. No, I'm not lonely. Well, I'm lonely. I'm not. Liar. I'm not lying, I said. I'm the strongest Takikomori in the world, so I can go on living by myself. Pain doesn't mean anything to me. Misaki, you should stop relying on other people too. In the end, everyone is alone. Being alone is the best. I mean, it's true, isn't it? In the end, you'll be absolutely alone. Therefore, being alone is natural. If you accept that, then nothing bad can happen. That's why I shut myself away in my six-mat one-room apartment. Aren't you lonely? I'm not lonely. Aren't you lonely? I'm not lonely. Liar! Someone spoke in a low, muffled voice. I turned around to look behind me. I found myself standing in the middle of my six-mat one-room apartment. In the corner, I sat, hugging my legs to my chest, melting into the deep darkness. It was night, and I couldn't see, hear, or do anything. Despite the fact that it was summer, this six-mat one-room apartment, devoid of furniture or anything else, was cold. A dark and terrible chill filled the isolated space. I held my head and trembled. I said, I'm lonely. I'm not lonely. Liar. I'm not lying. I'm so lonely. I am lonely. The quivering, shaking, shivering me was clack, clack, clacking his teeth. The me standing in the middle of the room watched this. I thought I'd gone crazy, but I wasn't crazy. There were only two things that I understood. I was alone, and I was incredibly lonely. I didn't want to be in this state. I didn't want to be lonely. Anyway, I screamed. That's why. I kept shouting. Being lonely is natural. Of course I hate being lonely. That's exactly why I shut myself off from the world, why I lock myself up. 
thinking about it for the long term, this is the best solution. You understand, right? Hey, you understand me, right? There was no answer. Don't you understand? Listen carefully to what I'm saying. If you do, you'll get it. You can grasp this easily. In short, in short, I shut myself in because I'm lonely, because I don't want to face any more loneliness. I shut myself away. Hey, do you understand? That's the answer. There was no reply. I'm greedier than anyone. I don't want some half-assed happiness. I don't need some partial warmth. I want a happiness that goes on forever. That's impossible though. I don't know why it is, but in this world, some interference is sure to come in. Important things break right away. I've been alive for 22 years and I know at least this much. It doesn't matter what the thing is, but it will break. That's why, from the beginning, it's better not to need anything. That's right. You should learn this truth too, Misaki. If you do, you won't come up with any more ridiculous plans. You'll stop looking to other people like me for help. She was terribly stupid. She was clinging to a horrifyingly enormous despair. I was appalled by the loneliness that caused her to seek help from a piece of human trash like me. I cursed the misfortune that had fallen upon her. I cursed the unreasonable fact that children couldn't choose their parents. I wanted a cheerful girl like her to live strong and be healthy. Please do your best somewhere. I'm all right. I'll be fine on my own. It's best for me to be alone. I'll live alone and die alone. Even still, I had hope. I had hope. Look, just over there. It's shining, pale and gentle. It was my hometown, the one that drew forth nostalgic, bittersweet tears. Autumn plains that continued forever, memories from long ago. The eternally fleeting glances from giggling little girls. The peace of the black cat, hit by a car. There was no longer anything painful or difficult anywhere. I was fine now. That's right, you are now, said a little girl. The life-sized anime doll which Yamazaki had left behind as a present stared at me. She was an angel. She started to move and she guided me forward. We traveled to a faraway planet. It was beautiful, a blue sky with white clouds the cool wind blowing across a spring field that stretched into the distance. We stood in the middle of the field, and the girl picked one pure white flower and held it up in front of me. With her slender fingers, she grasped a petal and pulled it out. Life. Then she pulled out another petal. Death. She was telling me a flower fortune. Life. Death. Life, death, life, death, life, death. The last petal fluttered to the ground. The girl smiled gently.